Up is down, black is white, using SCCM for wrong and right. We're going to kind of go over some of the offensive SCCM and defensive SCCM stuff we've used in the field. Is it down? You should just go. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know how computers work. <laughs> oh. It's oh broken! My God. There we, there we go. go. Okay. All right. So that's me. That's my Twitter handle. Um, I'm a penetration tester and red teamer for a various group adaptive threat division. I've been there for about a year and um, it's amazing. Um, I'm an active developer on the PowerShell Empire framework. So if anybody's used or heard of Empire. Um, Has anyone heard of Empire? Yeah, sweet. Right on. I love offensive PowerShell. Um, the day PowerShell dies is the day that I go back to Indiana and start farming corn. Um, <laughs> I was a sysadmin while in college, that's the SCCM stuff. Um, I actually administered SCCM for about a year and a half before I um, started the offensive stuff. And I've smoke, spoken at SHMU, um, the Fire Talks, and B-Sites DC. So this is my third con. Um, so Who's getting the hang of it? Starting to get the hang of it. So I'm Will Schrader, my handle is HarmJoy. I'm a security researcher and red teamer for the same group with Matt, the Adaptive Threat Division. I'm a co-founder and kind of active offensive developer in a handful of projects, so I help found and write a big chunk of the Veil framework, which I talked about two years ago here at B-Size Boston, some of the obfuscated pine cellar stuff. I wrote uh, PowerView, PowerUp, a lot of the offensive PowerShell toolkit that we use on our red team engagements. I'm a co-founder active developer of Empire, and also we recently released Python Empire for OSX, and we're trying to combine the projects. And if anyone wants to talk about anything else that's either SCCM or not SCCM after, we'll go out to the hallway, and we'd love just to talk to anybody about anything. I'm an active PowerSploit developer now, and I was recently awarded the Microsoft PowerShell MVP, so got to go do some of the summits and all that. Spoken at a few cons, and I was at uh, B-Sides Boston two years ago, like I mentioned. So, love this con. It's awesome. Had a, have a great time and cool conversations with everybody. All right, so a little bit about this talk. Um, we're going to kind of go over what red teaming is versus what pen testing is and how we tend to define it. Um, and then kind of the difference between hunting and incident response um, and how that... Um, you know, works into SCCM a little bit. Um, we're going to cover the basics of SCCM, so what is it, what can it be used for, um, how to not administer it, and then how we typically see SCCM set up in the enterprise. And so this isn't like a, here's how you should set it up and, and be safe with it, it's a, how do we see a lot of the organizations tend to follow a pattern of how they set it up and how we're able to abuse that to, to do what we want. Um, so that's going to move us into using and abusing SCCM, and so we're going to kind of cover um, you know, how the backend set up a little bit, um, how we can use it as an attack platform, um, how we're able to push out agents to, um, you know, host inside the network, how we're able to use that to hunt, um, you know, for different users and computers and, and use integrated technology within the network to accomplish our goals without introducing anything foreign. And then um, we're going to kind of go over a little bit of using SCCM for good for hunting and response and, and how that can be applied for um, detecting bad. And then there'll be a demo um, using it um, very briefly for some offensive stuff. Cool. So a little bit of background to get everyone on the same page. These are, you know, the, the, the stock. This is kind of like what we're talking about. This is what we mean by hunting. This is what, how we define red teaming and pen testing. So pen testing... I'm sure as a lot of people know, like who's actually, who does pen testing or red teaming for like, okay, there, there's a chunk of people that do this. So like, you know, there's no universal definition of like what's a red team versus what's a pen test, right? So for pen testing, we've seen it defined as could be anything from a single person running a vulnerability scan and putting their company's logo on it. Not that any company has ever done that or we, none of us have ever read the reports of that happening. Uh, it could be a few testers for, you know, one or two weeks. Or it could be a multi-week assault, you know, for, with a large team over a long period of time. We view, we personally view pen testing as uh, kind of a breadth, uh, breadth first focus. You know, we're not saying that we have the right definition. This is just how we interpret it. So we feel like the, the goal of pen testing is find as many um, problems and security issues as possible in a particular environment. And then we kind of combine that a little bit with, we try to escalate as far as we can, but we're focused on trying to find a breadth of vulnerabilities for a company, right? So this definitely has its place. And you know, you have a limited time frame in general, you're gonna use open source tools, you're not gonna use super custom malware, you're not gonna do whatever else because that stuff costs money and time, right? We view red teaming as just a little bit different and for us the definitions have started to kind of blur based on the tool sets we've developed but we really kind of view red teaming as the the chance to test the instant response process for a company 
So uh, we view it as a training opportunity for defenders. So we don't remove logs. Uh, and ideally for us, certain parts of a red team are caught and certain parts aren't. We want to find the noise threshold for a company. You know, we don't want to say, look, we, you didn't detect a single thing. We're super, super stealthy. And like, look at us for super crazy, awesome APT simulators or something. There's el small elements of that. But we're not trying to prove we're smarter than all the instant responders. We want to help them get better. Uh, so, you know, maybe we start stealthy, and if they don't detect anything over the course of engagement, we might start dialing the noise up until they actually figure out that we are there. So we can see, like, are you properly imaging a box? Are you pulling drives? Are you doing memory dumps? You know, how does your incident response process work? So, but in general, you try to simulate a bit more of an advanced adversary. It's usually at least like a three week time frame for us, sometimes more. Um, yeah, and sometimes we'll write custom tools. Uh, we'll, we'll develop custom tradecraft for an engagement. So this ACS, SCCM stuff actually came about from some of the red teams. So, you know, we didn't, on a one-week pen test, we didn't custom roll in a, you know, a, a PowerShell module that does, like, advanced SCCM exploitation, but because we had the time and opportunity and uh, the kind of latitude to do that in a red team, we were able to. So incident response, you know, kind of a similar analogy, like, we view like pen testing to hunt as kind of, or pen testing to red teaming is kind of instant response to hunt. In general, instant response is, you know, the five alarm fire concept. It's kicked off by network monitoring tools, alerts. Uh, it's very reactive. By the time that you detect something happening with instant response, um, it's often, it might be a little bit too late, but, you know, uh, it's I, ideally you want to be a bit more proactive, which is kind of what we mean by hunting. It's a U.S. Department of Defense concept, just kind of like red teaming. A lot of these concepts came from groups that have been doing them for a long time, which is basically U.S. government agencies or more advanced, advanced types of groups. So it's the blue version of the assumed breach mentality, which I'll talk about quickly in a second. And this is, you know, the, the standard lingo for hunting is detection, investigation, response, deny, degrade, disrupt, manipulate. So it's hunt, it's going, uh, you're going out and looking for bad guys in your network before uh, it's tripped off by an AV alert or something, right? Assume breach is the mentality of assuming that there's already an adversary in your network. So this ties into red teaming. So, you know, we, we might manipulate kind of how we um, approach the engagement with the assumption of an embedded advanced adversary. And with hunting, you're like, well, we don't have any AV alerts or we don't have any sim alerts, but there's probably somebody there if they're good enough. So let's develop techniques to go find where they are. This is one of uh, my favorite quotes. It's from the Microsoft Enterprise Cloud Red Teaming White Paper, which if you, hadn't, uh, if you haven't read, definitely go read it. It's free by Microsoft, it's like 40 pages, but they have this great quote from Michael Hayden, who's the former director of the CIA and NSA, saying, fundamentally, if someone wants to get in, they're getting in, accept that. Uh, but what we tell clients is number one, you're in the fight whether you thought you were or not, and number two, you're almost certainly penetrated. This doesn't mean just throw up your hands and say, well, there's nothing we can do, let's just you know, call it a day and go home. It's just realizing that you're not gonna stop uh, a determined enough adversary with enough funding. So now we gotta talk about SUCM a little bit. So, what is SUCM? It stands for Microsoft System Center Configuration Manager, and so, in a very short synopsis, it allows you to push out applications and updates, um, kind of like WSUS a little bit, where you can manage, you know, like Flash, Chrome. You can manage your endpoints with um, a centralized management point. Um, it's self-maintained in the sense that the clients have agents installed, um, and then they are calling back to a server. So it's a lot like an internal RAT. Um, if you gain control of it, you can essentially just use that as your command of control without having to egress. Um, and so they'll periodically check in to get new stuff. Um, the check-in times vary from client to client. They can set that up in the, in the setup itself. Um, the package that we made can force a device check-in, so if you don't feel like yep. waiting around forever. And we'll go over all the details. Yep. And, yep. Oh, one other thing to mention with the SCCM is it's not just command and control. It also does kind of all automatic information gathering. So by default, it'll see like what are the recently launched applications, where are the installed packages, where are the shares. And there's a lot of different options you can have to tune it to gather even more information with your existing architecture. And we'll go over some of the defensive tuning components later on in the presentation. Yep, so how we typically see it in an enterprise is that they'll have one central server um, and then they'll have distribution points. And so they all this stuff gets replicated out to the distribution points, which can be widespread throughout the country. Um, they're supposed to kind of have it set up so that um, you know there are service accounts that run you know, to push updates so that when 
yeah. SCCM pushes out clients to host that has to have local admin to install it. And so they're, the way we see it most is they've got a domain admin service account that is installing and pushing this stuff out. Um, and so f as far as the applications go, um, typically they're hosted up on an open share so that you know the endpoints can reach out and grab the packages. One thing that I've seen the most of is admins in these shares will leave install nodes, install scripts that have credentials in them. Nine times out of ten for the service account, that's a domain admin that's running on the SCCM box. Um, so that admins are going to admin. Well, it makes fun of me for saying that, but it never fails. Everybody always somewhere leaves something on a share that um, allows us to kind of abuse SCCM. And the important thing to, to note about this is that this isn't a, here's how you go pwn SCCM, it's how once you have access to it, how can you use it to to further you know operate in the network? Yeah, this is a post exploitation concept uh, in this presentation on the offensive side. So we're not exploiting SCCM. If it's set up correctly, there's not really anything you can do to attack it. But um, that's very very rarely set up 100% yeah, so correctly. Okay. Typically, they're managed via controlled groups, um, and so you get access to a user that's part of that controlled group who's not a domain admin but can administer SCCM, and you can use that to pivot your way up. Did I skip this? There, no, that's okay. Right so that's kind of what the architecture looks like in a very high level. So you've got your primary site server, and then you've got your distribution points, and then um, you know you've got different domains, and your clients are reaching out to whatever distribution points closest to them, and then it's all replicated. So SCCM has two kind of backend components. There's a SQL database which stores a lot of information, and um, a WMI backend which also stores a lot of information. Um, it's important to note that the stuff you see in the console um, for SCCM is not even a fraction of the amount of information SCCM actually collects. So digging through the backend WMI and, and classes in the SQL database, it's mind-blowing the amount of information that's actually gathered. Um, so the way that Power SCCM works is we're able to manipulate the SQL database and WMI classes directly to the back end without going through the front end interface. And so we're able to hide a lot of things from the actual um, you know, front end that admins are gonna see when they log in. And the key here is there's two ways to interface with it. Uh, the SQL interface tends to be better for defense because you can get a lot of these linked tables and a lot, a lot more like detailed contextual information. But it's very difficult to modify it. So you have all these stored procedures and everything's linked and whatever else. So it's, it was difficult for us to figure out how do we create a malicious package and push it out through pure SQL. But WMI is a lot simpler. You don't have as much information because you can't do the equivalent of linked tables. But it makes it much easier to manipulate and create components. So we use, we recommend SQL, the SQL approach and the SQL interface for defense and WMI for offense. Yeah, and we'll show a query or the difference between the two for a simple pulling the same information and what they look like here in a bit. So SQL, um, it's just a normal, you know, SQL backend. There's nothing crazy about it. I'm not a SQL dev, so I don't do SQL stuff. So I see SQL, I'm like, oh my God, it's ugly, get it away. Um, it's great for, as Will was saying, it's great for gathering information. So it clo it collects a lot of lot of really juicy information that that might not be stored in WMI. Um, the issue with SQL is you, to be able to pull all that information directly, you have to have a relatively decent background or um, in depth knowledge of the database itself and how all the tables and stuff work out. And that's because this is what the schema looks like. It's not properly documented. Uh, it's kind of documented by Microsoft, not 100%. So I spent about four days straight trying to parse through every single one of these tables and then the same bit of information of saying, show me installed applications. It's in like four different places and there's a view, then there's one with some information, not other information. Some of it links to the client, some of it doesn't, some of it has randomized SIDs. So I, if anyone's a SQL admin or a DBA, I don't envy your job because this was not fun trying to like basic reverse engineer how the schema is actually set up and how everything is linked. And then each one of these tables and each field and all these views are kind of essentially mapped to equivalent WMI classes in the back end. But again, that's not documented. So we we did our best with Power SCCM to abstract away a lot of this complexity so you don't have to memorize all these queries exactly where it's going. But it, uh, it's not complete, I guess, is the point. So we're because we're not uh, SQL experts, we did our best, but uh, no guarantees. So I'm not going to go through all these, but this is a small example of some of the really interesting tables. You know, show me 
the current processes, you know, view GS current pro of course that makes sense. I have no idea about the naming scheme. Or historical processes. HS doesn't actually stand for historical, it stands for something else. And in certain fields, these are switched. And GS has historical and HS has non-historical. So whatever. But you can do tons of stuff with like browser helper objects, software files, drivers, uh, open shares, currently logged on users. There's a huge amount of stuff that if you tune up the collection component, you can get some awesome stuff that you can either manually search from the defensive side with PowerSCCM or throw it into something like Splunk and we'll have a slide on kind of configuring, uh, hooking all that stuff up for your sim. But tons and tons of stuff. Uh, I think the browser helper objects kind of kind of blew my mind. Oh, auto starts, you could find a lot of really basic persistence and things like that. And then WMI, um, you know, it uses WQL, the um, WMI query language. Um, so you can interact with this really easily with PowerShell via the get WMI object, which is how we end up doing it on the back end. Um, like we were saying earlier, WMI, it's so much easier to update. You, it's just a one-line thing versus, like, spending three and a half hours crafting a SQL query. Um, the, the neat thing about WMI is that you can... If you match up all the properties, you can just throw it at the classes and it'll update the stuff in the back end. So some of like an application package requires a non-trivial XML schema to actually describe everything. So instead of having to figure out how to link that in the database, we can just push that out to one WMI class property and then the back end takes care of everything and does all the awesome stuff for and us. And that's not super documented either. So I had to push out applications and then pull the XML and figure out what was required and what yeah, was Yeah, where Microsoft doesn't have a MSDN about here's how you create a hidden malicious package yeah. that doesn't touch this. Mm -hmm. I don't know why they didn't do that. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. so that's kind of what it looks like. Um, this is through WMI Explorer. If everybody use that, it's an amazing resource to, to browse WMI pretty quickly. Under the SMS yeah. namespace. So everything's under the root SMS and then uh, the site underscore and then the site code that's operating out of. And then there's just an incredible amount of different classes that you can, that you can interact with. Yep, so he's, while I was spending four days looking through the SQL schema, he spent about four days looking through the WMI schema to try to find equivalent stuff. And the naming, the naming scheme for the classes versus SQL, that's equally as frustrating because none, none of the names make sense. And so you're like, oh, this seems like maybe this is something I need, and then it turns out to be something completely different. So this is the difference. This is to get all applications. Um, WMI, that's a query, and then that's what we use for SQL. Um, so a lot of the functions in PowerSCCM uh, will wrap a super long SQL query with all the arguments and everything abstracted out, so you don't have to worry yeah. about it. But so if you want to throw it into like a custom sim ingester or something like that, you can just pull the raw query straight out of the PowerSCCM package and do it manually if you'd like. Yeah. And this really, this really shines in where you have a lot more, you can get much more granular with SQL in the sense that you can do all of this and you can craft really detailed specific queries versus WMI, you're kind of, you're kind of limited into what the classes or properties are actually available to you, um, which is what makes SQL a lot nicer for Hunt and all that good stuff. Cool. Got on time. So that that's uh, enough of us complaining about how... Yes, go ahead. You mentioned that WMI can be used there. Is that an assumption that SSCM requires as an inbound SSCM or an open question? Yeah, I mean, it's so the question was, you know, are, what assumptions are you making as far as the open ports and different things like that? So it's... It's standard Windows functionality is the same port that WMI uses for remote SQL connections. It's the same port that you know SQL uses. And it's hard to block because when the clients check in, that stuff's getting updated. Yeah, so in general, the, the ports and everything tend to be relatively open on the SCCM servers themselves because it's, you know, if they try to lock down everything, you know, it probably introduces issues when they're using it in production. So more often than not, they'll like drop a lot of the firewall rules and make it relatively open. So enough of us complaining about how terrible schema is and that's super exciting. We're gonna go over the PowerSCCM package, which is a proper PowerShell module that we published for this stuff. It's not on the PowerShell gallery, it's on, we'll have links at the end, it's on the, the PowerShell Mafia group repo that has like PowerSploit, PowerSCCM, and a, a bunch of the really cool proper packages we've been developing. So background, uh, along with you know, if you're trying to abuse SCCM properly in the field, along with needing uh, uh, knowledge about the WMI scheme and the SQL scheme and everything else, you have to have a pretty detailed knowledge about SCCM. So we wanted to abstract away a lot of that complexity and bring a lot of this functionality to people on engagements and the offense and defensive side to use it without having to be experts in this stuff. So there's not a lot of public information on abusing SCCM. 
the only presentation we're aware of was Dave Kennedy and Dave and Dave DeSimone's uh, DEF CON 20 only one to rule them all presentation. It's, it's super cool. Definitely go check it out. And I think this function was actually, actually introduced into the social engineering toolkit. So you can push some stuff out that will like patch some existing SCC and packages and push out agents to a large number of machines. It was great. This is a few years ago. We saw this, we're kind of inspired and we wanted to take this to the next level. Instead of saying mass ownage, how about we hunt for exactly where certain people are and create targeted collections in a very hidden kind of more like red teamy type way. So basic usage for the package. You import your PowerShell module, and we have a, ses a session-based model in SCCM. So very similar to SIM sessions and like Windows remoting sessions. We have uh, like new SCCM session, which you can specify WMI or SQL. It registers it, saves it off as an object with all the configurations, and then you pass those objects in the PowerShell pipeline to um, any of the querying or abuse type functionality that you need. So, you know, get SCCM session, you know, get SCCM application. So if you're not used to PowerShell, this is a bit weird, but we were trying to do it like properly PowerShell-y because my boss being Matt Graber, Manifestation, he said that I actually have to write proper PowerShell now instead of just writing scripts. So yeah, uh, removing remove SCCM session will kill the session. And one thing that I didn't mention before is if you're trying to determine where the site servers are and all these site codes are, we have functionality that'll let you do that as well too. So. If you land on a local machine, you can use find local SCCM info and it'll return all the configuration stuff, all the site codes. If you know where the SCCM server is, we have interfaces that will let you enumerate all the sites and distribution points remotely. So uh, pretty much anything we could think of for uh, normal functionality, how we would use it, we tried to build command lists that would automate this. Permissions? Yes. What permissions are required? What permissions are required? Well, yeah, he'll go over that just a little bit in the, the attack side, but you need you know administrative access on the SCCM server, right? So again, like he had said, that ideally in a perfect world, there's no way you could do that, but there's you don't need domain admin to actually administer an SCCM server, which a lot of people think. Yes? Can you do that on a box that is not in domain? Uh, can you use it on a box that's not a domain? I th we integrated credential objects, um, external credential objects into this project. We didn't do extensive testing as far as like a non-domain join machine. We typically have just used it on a, a regular domain join machine for the most part, like you fish your initial user. But with additional credential objects, you don't have to have you know a DA context running in order to interact with it. You can pass the credential object. So as an example, you know, import Power SCCM, new SCCM session, you know, doing the computer name for the SCCM site server, whatever the site code is. And in this particular instance, we're gonna use SQL. This will connect off, um, save everything up. You see all the particular SQL permissions, site codes, connections, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. And this is how you would actually use it. Just like in that previous slide, the example I showed, this is what the output will look like. You'll get a ton, ton, ton of stuff. These are all proper PowerShell objects. So if you're used to like filtering in the pipeline and all that, it should work correctly. Uh, what was this? SC services, yeah. So in that particular machine, that particular IP address, it'll list all the running services, right? Nothing too crazy, but you can start to do some cool stuff with it at the end. So using SCCM as an attack platform. This is the cool stuff. This is Defense cool is stuff. lame, whatever, I had to do that, but offense is, <laughs> offense is the cool stuff. So in our red teams, we tend to stay towards or operate more towards using admin tools against them. So we're unauthorized domain admins is the way that we see it, is we just go in and administer stuff for them. Um, so the nice thing about SCCM is it already exists. And so you're not introducing anything new into the environment, minus maybe your egress point. Um, so traffic is completely normal. Um, a lot of people don't think of looking at a forensic or hunt or incident response level of, hey, maybe something happened in SCCM. Like we should go look at this. And something that's uh, not a solved problem that we know of publicly. You know, if attackers are abusing SCCM, how do you do forensics on the SCCM server itself in the database, and how can you detect these packages? This does leave a lot of artifacts in there, so that'd be something for someone to look into. I think would be very interesting. Yep. And there have been rumors of some actors actually using SCCM to mass deploy um, MBR wipers after they're done. In the there was a, actually a crime war gang in the news a couple months ago. They used SCCM to push out crypto locker for an entire domain. So instead of one machine, it's like, oh, look, we found this. Yeah, everything's crypto locker. So looking normal greatly reduces your chances of actually getting caught, which is what we're relatively confident in. Um, 
Yep. Yep. So. This goes to the permission question. Attacking SCCM.DA. When we initially introduced the concept, we got a lot of pushback of like, oh, well, if you have DA, it's already over type of thing. Um, that's why we like to stress that this is a very, there, this is very much of a post-exploitation thing and not an initial vector thing. Um, and so the way that you're supposed to set it up is you, you don't run everything as DA, you know, um, delegate your groups out, only give access to what's needed. Um, and so people will have SCCM admins. And so using something like PowerView, you can go and hunt for SCCM admins. You know, find a way to get it, once you actually get their uh, credentials or access or whatever. Um, you might not have access to the entire network, but you can use that to pivot throughout the network in a different way than what might be normal um, to, to get to your crown jewels or your, your other elevated accounts. Um, yep. yep. So as I mentioned earlier, getting a group, you can kind of hunt for some of the groups that have SCC men, and this will give you a good ideas of, or a good idea of what users you want to go hunt. And that first step is, you know, figuring out what's the naming scheme. This kind of goes, it blends with the offensive active directory stuff, so we're not going to go heavily into that because those are, that's yeah, a huge other like you know bit of knowledge, but we're happy to talk about it later. But identify who you want to who you want to go after, start grouping them, and then continue. And if you haven't seen Will's talk in Troopers 2016 um, about PowerView, go check it out. So using SCC for code execution. Um, so like I said, mentioned like I mentioned earlier, um, the clients check in to the server. If there's a new application or package, um, it'll download it and execute it. Um, and so what this means is that if we can gain access to that, we can host a binary payload on a share, or we can create some sort of malicious deployment or application. Um, and when the code, the way that we set Power SCCM up is, um, it actually, it's all using PowerShell, so there's no you know new binaries or any of that stuff. So, so normally you would RDP into the GUI, right? So you would compromise an SCCM admin or the server itself. And then just RDP in and use the exact same SCCM admin functionality that, that admins would otherwise. And we got tired of doing that, so uh, do it hence the remote station. package. Yep, and then it runs a system, so that's nice. It's always fun. It's always fun. So using it for evil. These are kind of the offensive commandlets um, that we kind of we went over them a little bit. The new, um, and we'll go over the whole process of grouping the users, pushing the applications, and linking everything yeah. together. So this is more for reference. We'll tweet out these slides right after the presentation, so we're not going to like detail every single every command line because yeah. that would be super exciting. So hunting for users, you know, you can do that with PowerView already. The nice thing about SCCM is it logs and collects where users are logged in. Um, you know, what time they're logged in, what boxes they're logged in on. And so you can actually use that to, to pull out targets. And so um, you can use get SCCM computer. If you know a little bit about PowerShell, I plan on fixing this um, so you can just pass a username. But right now you can just pull out the last log on username. And um, if it equals whatever you're looking for, it'll return the target and you can um, you know, go about what you want to do with it. And um, there's also the get SCCM console usage. So SCCM collects data in different ways. Um, and so sometimes the last log on username can be finicky and might not be. Yeah, so that's more accurate. like the Windows session kind of component, and this is going to be logging the actual command line yeah. uh, execution. So, yeah, occasionally it's not 100% accurate, and sometimes SCCM misses information in certain ways. So it's just two different ways to get to the same the objective. The SCCM console usage is enabled by default, and that, that's been the most accurate from what I've seen. Um, it almost instantaneously tells you who's logged in and when they logged in. So this is kind of what hunting for users look like. You just give it a username, and it's like here are your targets. Sure. So that's kind of the first step. Or step point five is figuring out where are the groups and everything else you want to target. Uh, and then the regular first step is okay, uh, who like where are my actual target users logged in? Where is the incident response staff logged in? Like what's the group that I'm going after? And this is kind of step two. Yeah. So after you have your targets, um, what you would do next is throw them in a collection is what SCCM calls a collection of, you have all of the, the devices or user objects that you want to push an application out to. And so you can get really granular with like, well these computers only get a certain application and um, so that allows you to create collections for your targets. So you just gather up all your targets, throw them in a collection, and then you're only pushing out your code to those specific targets um, instead of like the whole entire enterprise. Yeah. Like we said, just trying to take that to the next level. Instead yeah. of, it'd be easy enough to push an application out to every single machine, but we're 
to us that's not the best trade craft always on on a red team and also we're lazy and we don't want to have to clean up everything and say like, and managing you know a thousand agents coming back and get a little bit tricky and then empire will crash and everything because uh whatever so, so mass opponent is bad target control opponent is good um also it makes for you know logging you only have a handful of targets you have to keep track of so this is how you would group um, your targets using power SCCM. Um, you can just do a new SCCM collection and give it a name and then a collection type. And so you have two collection types, you have users and devices. And so I haven't seen people set up SCCM to actually like have user objects or user groups. Um, I've always seen it just devices. Um, some orgs might use users. Um, the functionality is there if you want to create a user collection. So you, instead of pushing it out to just these host names, you can push it out to these users and whatever um, workstation is associated with that user yep. is the one that will get it. But all that crazy WMI stuff in the back end, just super easy, all the tab completable command lines, so you don't have to worry about all the cruft in the back end. <laughs> yep. And once you create the collection, it creates it empty, and then you can use the add SCCM device to collection to actually add um, the computer name or targets that you want to to that collection. Um, and so you start adding them up, and then once everything's in the group, then you're able to, um, to just push it out. Which this, this is the coolest part, I think. So this took a really long time for me to figure out, and Will was like, I have no idea how you figure this out, this makes no sense. And I saw like, I have no idea how to figure this out, this makes no sense. Um, so you can create a malicious application directly via WMI. Um, which, there's, a, there's an is hidden property that you can set. This is the part that blows our minds. So normally when you create an application right in the GUI, it shows up, right? There's a hidden field. Which, you just said is hidden and it doesn't show And it up. doesn't hide it, which I can't think of a legitimate reason for that to exist. Like, why would you want to hide an application? But I mean, So when we create the malicious application with malicious logic, if a regular SCCM admin pulls up the regular GUI, they don't see any of the malicious logic. And as I was talking about trying to do forensics and stuff on this, I think it would be really interesting. Yeah. So we just, um, you know, in the back end, uses WMI, and then it takes a giant XML blob and just patches in you know, the code that we want to push and it just shoves it up into the WMI class and it's it's there hidden and nobody can see it. And so you can do this with new SCCM application. Um, you just pass it a name and then there are a few options. There's, you so know. You can push out binary packages. Our, our preference is obviously PowerShell. So like Empire, like the output's Base64. Um, so you can just throw in, um, you know, Base64 blob and it'll run um, you know, PowerShell, attack ENC and then it'll run the code. And so you're not introducing any um, additional binaries to the system or any of that. And one other kind of cool thing we ran into is normally with SCCM, there's when you're launching the application, there's a length limit on what you're actually allowed to run, right? So normal functionality is take an MSI and EXE on a, on a share and then have a launchy command that reaches back. We wanted to do PowerShell without touching disk, but the Empire stagers are too long to run it in one swoop. So we stuff all that logic into a custom WMI class on the SCCM server. We mess with the ACL so any user on the domain could read that WMI class. So, and then we push that out with the launcher. The client will run the command, read all the reach back, read all the data from the WMI class that, that's opened up, uh, run it uh, once they fetch the payload, then we clean everything up after so there's no evidence left as far as the logic. So this lets us run arbitrarily long PowerShell scripts Without it's without touching disk, it's in a WMI schema component in the back end, so it's technically on disk, but it's not a, fu a traditional file that's on disk. Yeah. And it, the client's reaching out when it when the code executes, and it, it re it's reaching out back to the SCCM server, so it's not entirely odd to see yeah. you know, from a network this, this doesn't look too weird. And that's what it looks like. Um, it gives you some... The verbose output for the, the actual like commandlets aren't that great, which I plan on fixing as well. Uh, but you can see the the launch CMD is what will actually execute on the system um, when applications pushed out. You see, you know, base sixty four decode this stuff, and you see this is the custom WMI class reaching back to the server, and it pulls it from the prop value or the prop. Yep. Cool. Um, it, WMI, they would see the WMI traffic coming back. Uh, that might not be super typical for traditional SCCM like execution, but everything else is. I forget what protocol it is, but it's you know the the normal SCCM like reach back polling type stuff. So it's not going to look weird. Uh, I don't think so. I'd probably we should we'd probably have, we'd yeah. have to watch our and see. We'd have to dive in a bit more. Sorry, can you? 
Uh, yes, so when you query through WMI or SQL in the schema backend, the hidden applications will show up. Uh, they just don't show up in the GUI. So you can take this and back and run, if you have SEC and run it and see if there are any hidden applications. Because but should be. We don't really know of, um, there's a couple of projects out there that were kind of similar from just an admin standpoint of interacting with SEC and remotely. We don't know of anyone that uses them. Um, so every single time we've seen it deployed, people just use the GUI. Yep. Cool. So after the application is created, you can then just push it out. Um, and so, you know, like I said earlier, we have our targets into a group, and then you can just do a new app, new SCCM application deployment, and just pass it the name and then the target so group. You want to creating the group of on. users, creating the malicious application, and this is what binds it together to and actually it deploy it, it to that collection. So there are three or four steps in actually getting it all out, and you have a lot of control through each step of making sure you're not touching a target you don't want them not touching. And then this, this is kind of cool. I'm still kind of working through the research of like how this exactly works. Um, but there's a function called invoke SCCM device check-in that will execute a, method, a WMI method on the back end of the SCCM server that will force members of a collection to check in. So instead of waiting three hours for these clients to check in, depending on you know how the, the, the company has their stuff set up, and you can trigger this in most of the time it will force, depending on the check-in schedule, it will force the actual collection members to check in. So you don't have to like just sit around. So it kind of has like a lightweight heartbeat that it does pretty frequently. And then every few hours or whatever the deployment cycle is, it actually says, okay, give me any applications that are going to be yeah. pushed down. So he just closes the window on that initial little heartbeat. It forces them to pull down whatever new application deployments are, are scheduled. Yeah, so it'll periodi periodically check in and then... If there's a new application or package that's available to be employed, it'll pull it down. Um, it just speeds it up a little bit. Little bit. Into the demo. Cool. So I'll, I'm unfortunately going to have to kind of cruise through the uh, the defense stuff a bit because we want to make sure we can actually show a video demo of this. So SCCM is a defensive solution. Just like we hide in the noise for red teaming, if you're a defender and you don't want to tip your hand to any like advanced adversaries out there, you also like to hide in normal functionality. So there are attackers that are sophisticated enough to where if they just see you know, some kind of defensive uh, imaging product or IR thing spin up on a machine, they can actually you know change their action, shut agents down, so you don't, again, you don't want to tip your hand. There's a lot of uh, really cool kind of previous defensive work actually with SCCM. There's uh, using SCCM violate best practices, using it for like IR. So these links will work in the slide deck once they're put up on slide share. So a lot of good stuff. A lot of the defense was drawn off of this existing work. There was a presentation a few years ago at one of the Sand Summits. Again, just using, actually using SCCM for incident response to defense, which is kind of a cool concept. So I'll go over tuning and some of the commandlets. By default, SCCM will collect a large amount of, a, a good chunk of interesting information, but like I mentioned before, there's a lot of stuff you can tune it up to get even more things. So if you want to have auto start software, browser helper objects, drivers, and all that, you have to enable this manually in your SCCM deployment. Luckily, you're not installing new software, you're just changing a couple settings that it just tells the SCCM agent to grab more information from each host when it checks back, checks back in. Pretty easy to do, just find settings, you know, hardware inventory, and then uh, enable you know, another chunk of classes. Uh, part of this is just for reference if people actually want to use this afterwards. This was, you know, a, a couple days we went through saying what would actually be interesting in using stuff. Also, you want to make sure that software metering is enabled. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. This gives you, like, a lot more of the recently launched applications and historical stuff, which is one of the more useful components for catching bad guys, like, uh, command line logging, right, without having to uh, set it up on the host and do Windows event forwarding and all that kind of stuff. This will pretty much already do it for you. So more, more kind of reference to make sure you have that enabled. And the last part for tuning would be software inventory. If you want to, you can have SCCM inventory every instance of a file of a particular pattern on the host. It won't give you MP5s, but it'll give you like publishers, like authors, uh, the names, arguments, all the Cool kind of stuff. So we like to recommend saying inventory every single executable on every single host in the environment. Pull that all back and you can find some very interesting stuff. A lot of commodity stuff, but also some you know malicious real like by the things. And defensive commandlets, you know, again as reference, you can process histories, recently used applications, drivers are pretty cool. Uh, more 
more stuff or oh these are some of the, the cooler kind of meta functions so uh, some post exploitation tools like Mimicats will have you know Prince Mandel be gentle Peewee, his name will be in like the publisher information. So if attackers change the name of the app, uh, most of them, they don't really know what they're doing, aren't going to actually go through and properly vet the EXE that they're using. So some of these commandlets will find all instances of Mimi Cats in your environment uh, if it's on disk. Right? So again, it's not a silver bullet, it's not going to catch up with Mimi Cats in memory. But you can start to build more interesting uh, detection capabilities by by correlating some of the publisher, like, not link, I forget, there's a, there's a couple of other fields that tend to link some of these hacking tools together. And last cool thing with defense is you can actually hook up the SCCM SQL database into ingesters for your normal SIM solution. So this blog post that I had cited in the references uh, walks you through how to link up SCCM to feed directly into Splunk. So you don't even have to use Power SCCM or whatever else. But you can just ingest all of this information from the SQL backend directly in and start doing uh, heuristics and analytics and build your own custom queries. So this, for a lot of people, if you have a SIM solution, this is probably the best approach for defense or it's the least overhead and it's literally just connecting up a consumer and then you get a huge new data set that you can pull in. I think it's more for us, it's trying to change the perspective of defenders of like, yes, you have this huge amount of data, why not use that for high heart? Because it's not gonna tip your hand. Cool, now we're gonna do so, sorry, the text is a little small, Matt's going to talk through this. Yeah. So, the way this is set up, through, you know, an agent, we have Fox and the work that's talking to the environment, and, uh, you know, running a fine local SCCM info where between the local info and then you can use that to create a new SCCM session. And then you can use get SCCM session to check and make sure that everything. Okay, yeah, this is all stored in like the back-end session model that then you pipe to whatever command you want. You can have multiple sessions going, so you know, you, if you have multiple site servers, multiple sites, you want to be more granular. And you can use the SEC console usage and filter to see the site software for you. So we're hunting for a user, and then that returns, returns the workstation name that they're um, you know, logged into, and we can use that for targeting. Um, and then next you would move into actually creating a collection and then adding like, that device to the collection. Um, I would be cautious of what you name it because the collections do show up and so if you name it like targets LOL, people like <laughs> Or, yeah, red team targets or something. Yeah. So we, we look, there's not an in, instant field for the collections, unfortunately. Yeah, I was hoping. Do you have to create a collection? Yes. Yeah, so you do, the question is, do you have to create a collection? So it's fundamentally the architecture you have to have that on. This is just validating that it was created by using the SEC collection, um, which returns the collections that are quickly created. Um, so it's always nice to just validate that it was actually created um, for safety's sake. And then you can move into actually adding the device to the collection. Um, and I hope that at one point they can see have multiple of them at once, but right now I think it's just set up so you can do one at a time. Um, and then you just specify the collection name and then that will actually add it into the collection. And then, like I said, like the output itself isn't super verbose and be like, hey, it works. Like, if it doesn't, if red text doesn't vomit everywhere, it probably works. Um, that's kind of fair checking. Um, then you can move into creating the application itself. Now that we actually have the device that we want to target and the collection that we want to um, add that device to. And then, um, here we're going to be using a an Empire payload, so I've already generated it. You'll just take the, the actual B64 file, and it's Unicode, so if you do use this, make sure that you use the B64 Unicode. Um, there are a few different options, so you might have to enable a little bit. And then that will return the actual one-liner that the, uh, the package of the application will actually execute on the system to. So that in one swoop, they created the application, stuck all that logic in the custom WMI class, opened up the permission, and it's ready to then we can actually do the deployment. Um, and so you're just you know, specifying the application name, what collection you want to push it to. And again, we're not you know, we're not on the SCCM server itself. Yeah, Part of our workstation with writes, but doing it all remotely. Where is it? Is it in the flag? Uh, it's implicitly set. Yeah. In the oh, okay. So, yeah. And you can unhide it if you want. Yeah, by default. And you can invoke the, the check-in. Um, so it'll return the application name when it's successfully created, and then you can um, specify it. And the, the 
function that you want to force a check in, and then it will execute that WMI method, and then uh, after a few seconds, you should get a, an agent back. Um, this is kind of hit the actual invoking the check in is a little bit of missing times. I think it's something to do like the schedule of the heartbeat turn on. I'm sort of something to dig into a little bit. But, um, by default, how RSUCM runs code as system. Um, you can go in and change it um, if you want, but system's awesome, so I don't know why you would. Um, you can just say it's running as PowerShell because that's the actual process that was sorted as to reach out to the WMI class and actually grab it. There's a cleanup function. I, I intend to group these into like cleanup of the thing. Right now they're separate, and so you're going to remove the actual application. You have to do this in a specific order because things are linked together. So you can start in the top by actually deleting the component. Once the deployment's deleted, you have to delete the collection. We have, we have a couple of blog posts about this if you search for Power SCCM. I did a series on like blue, we keep it red, and you step through all of this in the exact process that you need to do before you clean up the uh, It's just three cleanup lines. Um, there's no like successes if you move. Like I said, like if it bomb is red, it broke. I need to add in some like proper verbose output, I guess. Um, this is all kind of thrown together, they're like not, so. Yeah, so now it's done, it's removed, there's not any direct UV evidence that any of this happened and we're able to compromise somebody by pushing back. Yep, that's pretty much it for, um, I think we still have, oh, well, yeah, good on time. We probably have just a minute or two for questions. Yes. Can you set uh, SCCM to alert when so um, the question is, can you set it up to do a learning when particular people log in? Um, I mean, you might be able to do like the, the console, but as far as doing a direct connection out to like the back end, like WMI, um, I don't, I don't think off the top of my head there's anything for that. It's more of like an information, like reach out query model. It's not as much of a. I don't think SCC can kind of push alerts down to us. Yeah. Connecting to the, the back end directly is kind of, it's not super documented and it's kind of a, a creative way of getting around the group itself. And so there aren't a lot of, it's just relying on permissions at the end of the day. So, and that's going to be the thing that we feel like that. So. Any other questions? Cool. Well, thank you guys. Okay.